This video is sponsored by MPB. Hey everyone, and welcome to a new video. Have you been thinking lately that you'd like to get into wildlife photography? Maybe you have a long lens you use to photograph your kids' sports, or maybe you'd just like to get out and get some exercise and need something to make that walk more interesting. If that's the case, this is the video for you. I'll teach you all you need to know to get started in wildlife photography, which on your own can have a steep learning curve. I'll teach you some tricks to make getting into wildlife photography easier and more successful for you. Settings, field techniques, equipment needed, and where and when to find subjects. If you stay till the end, I'll show you the science trick to help get shots like this. My name is Simon Dantremont, and I'm a professional nature and wildlife photographer living in Nova Scotia, Canada. I make weekly videos giving you photo tips or taking you behind the scenes for wildlife and nature photography. Subscribe if you want to see more. Okay, let's start by getting into what you need for equipment for wildlife photography. Luckily, you only need two things, a camera and a lens. Actually, not in that order. You need a lens and a camera. Why the twist? That's because in wildlife photography, the lens is more important than the camera and will more greatly impact your photos. Its ability to capture lots of light and be sharp are important attributes of a lens for wildlife and you should spend more money on the lens than the camera in most cases. A great lens on a cheap camera will yield better photos than a cheap lens on a professional camera body. And to prove the point, this $13,000 lens and this $400 used camera got me this photo right here. You want a lens of at least 300 millimeters in focal length. 300 is just enough, and with that focal length, you should expect your subject to be small in the frame, which we call environmental photos because it shows the subject in its environment, like in these photos here. These can still be very nice and make very impactful photos. If you get a longer focal length lens, like something out to 500 or 600 millimeters, you can start getting into wildlife portraits, where the subject is large in the frame. This doesn't mean that it's better than an environmental photo, it's just a different type of photo. The benefit of a sharp lens comes into play here also, where you can crop into your tighter view. Cropping is a normal part of wildlife photography, by the way. Our subjects are shy and elusive, so don't worry about filling the frame. But getting close does help with image quality. So a 75 to 300, 100 to 400, 100 to 500, or 150 to 600 zooms are popular lenses for getting into wildlife photography. Lenses depreciate more slowly than cameras, so investing in a really good one is a great idea. Prime lenses are often sharper and let in more light than zooms, and are often prized by wildlife photographers, but they can be very expensive. So now let's talk about cameras. I recommend an interchangeable lens camera. That way, you can do all kinds of photography with different lenses or upgrade your lenses over time. Cameras come with different sensor sizes too. Full frame, crop sensor, also called APS-C, micro four thirds, and even smaller sensors like those in bridge cameras with one permanently attached zoom lens. Full frames can be very expensive when starting out and take in wider fields of view of the photo. So while that's what I use personally, I don't think that's the best choice for most people just starting out. Smaller sensors take in a smaller piece of the scene, effectively giving you some extra magnification, which is cheaper than buying longer lenses. We call this the crop factor. So an APS-C sensor has a crop factor of 1.5 or 1.6, effectively magnifying your subject 50 or 60%. Handy for those small subjects we shoot. As such, for starting out, I recommend the middle size sensors like Micro Four Thirds in an Olympus or Panasonic camera, or a crop or APS-C common in Sony, Canon, Nikon, or Fuji cameras. I'd recommend Micro Four Thirds if having a light, small package is important. Otherwise, APS-C is a great choice as the bit larger sensor is a bit better in low light, but it makes for a slightly bigger package. Lens choices are abundant for this type of camera, which is a great bonus. If you already own a full frame camera, they can be great for wildlife photography, especially the higher megapixel versions. Just be mindful that you need to get longer focal length lenses to get the same equivalent reach. The most important attribute that's valued for a wildlife camera is a great autofocus system. Your subjects are moving around a lot and if you can't lock on to get a shot in focus, all the rest is in vain. 
Shooting birds in flight is especially tough and almost impossible without a good autofocus system, which will lead to frustration. New modern cameras with eye detection are amazing and worth getting if you can swing it. The next attribute for a camera that's very important is having a high frame rate. That is, more frames per second. This is what 12 frames per second sounds like. This is important so you can get lots of shots, ensuring at least some are sharp and in focus, even if all aren't. And you can pick the best pose from all your shots as your keepers. Sometimes peak action only lasts fractions of a second. And finally for cameras, a higher megapixel count is a big plus. We crop a lot in wildlife photography and more megapixels will allow you to crop your shots in and still have lots of resolution and sharpness left over. Now a camera and a lens are actually all that you need. A tripod or a monopod if you have a really big lens can come in handy, but I don't recommend one for smaller lenses. The ability to move around is more important. Don't buy a tripod with an adjustable center stock for heavy lenses. They really undermine the stability. Get one where the three legs meet at the tripod head. A sturdy ball head can work great on a tripod, but if you have a really large lens and can swing it, get a gimbal that are self-stabilizing and fantastic for long lenses. And I'm going to go against what everyone says online, even if I use them. Don't go out and automatically buy a teleconverter. People go out and buy a two times teleconverter and put it on their 75 to 300 millimeter lens and think that they magically have a beautiful 600 millimeter lens. Uh, no. Your lens is likely now at an aperture of F9 or F10, robbing you of valuable light, and your field of view is so small that it's hard to find stuff. Your autofocus is really slow or no longer works, and your images are much less sharp than before. Save buying a teleconverter for prime lenses and premium zoom lenses, and always go for the 1.4, not the two times. Okay, a quick primer on settings. First, shutter speed is your most critical setting. You need to freeze the movement, and long lenses need more shutter speed to get sharp photos. 1 500th of a second for static targets, 1 1,000th of a second for slow moving targets, and 1 2,000th or 1 2,500th of a second for fast action like flying birds. Given that shutter speed is so critical, you want to shoot in a mode where you control the shutter speed yourself. That would be shutter priority, TV, or in manual. I'd avoid automatic and aperture priority, AV, if you can, as the camera will set the shutter speed for you and it doesn't know how fast your subjects are moving. Most lenses for wildlife will have a maximum aperture of maybe 5.6 or f6.3. The majority of these are actually sharper at slightly smaller apertures, what we call being stopped down. So make that aperture f7.1 or f8 to squeeze out some extra sharpness, but don't stop the lens down to f11, for example. That will rob you of too much light, costing you in image quality or much needed shutter speed. The next settings to master are focus settings. First, put your camera in autofocus continuous. That's AFC on most camera brands, servo on a Canon. That makes the focus follow moving subjects, as opposed to one shot, which freezes the focus point. Our subjects are moving and the focus point needs to follow it. Next, use one single focus point for static targets and place that on the head, or better yet, the eye of your subject. That's what you want in focus. If a tail or wingtips are out of focus, don't sweat it. But keeping a single focus point on a moving subject is too difficult. Use multiple focus points for moving targets to increase the odds that your camera will lock on. Buying new gear can often be a challenge, but one of the easiest ways to get into wildlife photography is to buy your gear used. This is a great time to introduce the sponsor of this video, MPB, the world's largest global platform to buy, sell, and trade video and photo gear. They're not a marketplace, but rather they buy gear directly from you and inspect them before reselling them. I bought my first camera for wildlife used, and it was a great place to start. When you start something new, you don't always want to jump in with both feet financially. Dipping your toes into the water is a great way to begin a new adventure. All their gear goes through a 10-point inspection. The photos you see online are the actual products. They have the condition listed, and they come with a six-month warranty. There's something for everyone, whether you're just starting out or you're already seasoned in the field as the gear ranges from beginner to pro. If you already have some gear and would like to recycle some of it to get into a new genre like wildlife, you can sell your gear to them and buy used to replace it. Selling and trading saves you money, hassle, and tricky negotiations. 
I rarely give a direct buy this type of advice, but if I had $1,600 to get into wildlife photography, here's what I'd do. If you're not invested in a system already on MPB at the time of this recording, you can get a used Canon 7D Mark II for $600 US. It's a great camera. I own one. I have three or 400,000 clicks on it and it's still going. 10 frames per second and a great autofocus system. Pair that with a Sigma 150 to 600 Sport for a thousand bucks and you're off to the races with a great setup that can take amazing photos. Make sure you get the lens with the Canon EF mount. If you're in the Nikon system already, get the D500 for a couple hundred more. Very similar to the Canon with a high frame rate and great autofocus. Get the Nikon mount lens if you go this route. Go to mpb.com using the link in the description below and start recycling your gear and join the club of wildlife photography. They add over 2,000 products to their platform each week. There's a large selection of gear for every skill level. So now you've got your gear and a few settings figured out, it's time to find some subjects. Where do you find these things? One question I get all the time is, do you move around to find subjects or do you find a good spot and wait? The answer is both. Some subjects tend to frequent one favorite spot and the odds of finding wildlife at that particular spot is very good, like a duck pond for ducks. The best strategy here is to find a good spot and wait. Ducks will fly in and out of the pond and ducks in the ponds that are feeding, preening and diving will give you lots of photo opportunities, like these. Other subjects that are more uncommon like owls are more difficult. Wading in the woods for an owl to land in a nearby tree is a low opportunity opportunity, if you know what I mean. Walking in the woods or driving on dirt roads in the environment where they're known to frequent is the best technique. Same for finding coyotes or deer. Once you find them moving around, you may end up discovering their favorite spots that they frequent often. That's the time you can maybe set up a blind or wait for them to return to that spot. For birds, you can check out ebird.org, run by Cornell University. Birders record sightings there, so you can see what species you can find where. There's even a hotspot section, which is very helpful. Note that animal and bird movements are often seasonal, so don't expect to find the same wildlife at the same spot all year. Over time, you grow to learn where you can find what in what season, so it actually gets easier as you get more experience. Also, sometimes you just need to put in the time and spend time in nature. Like I say in some of my videos, the odds of seeing a bald eagle in your living room is actually quite low. And finally, don't forget friends and social media. Does your local bird society have a Facebook page or maybe a naturalist society? You can get great intel and meet other photographers there. Also, your local photography club may have field trips for wildlife. You'll meet other photographers, discover new locations and get free tips. After nailing down where to find, it's when to find. What time of day should I go out looking for wildlife? That's easy, morning and evening. The morning is when wildlife is the most active, feeding after a night's rest or staying active for a while after having been out all night, like a coyote returning to its den after hunting at night. The earlier you can get out and be on location near sunrise, the better. The morning light is also soft and photogenic, so the best light is at the same time, bonus. The evening is the next best. When the hot sun gets low, it's more comfortable for wildlife to get out and be more active, and the nightlife of insects and small mammals like rodents starts heating up. A great time for wildlife to be able to find food and for you to get photos. The least productive time is the midday. It's also the least photogenic light. Full midday sun doesn't make for pretty photos. The saturation is robbed from your photos and the bright highlights get blown out. An exception is on a cloudy day where the light is not too harsh and wildlife might be at least a bit active. So how do you get close to wildlife? This is often one of the most difficult parts of wildlife photography. Learning field craft takes time and you'll slowly get better and better as time goes on. But here are a few tricks. First, mammals often have a good sense of smell. Approach mammals with the wind in your face or sideways to the subject. If the wind is at your back, they'll smell you. When sneaking up on wildlife, stay low, keeping your outline out of view. Use trees, rocks, or elevation changes to hide your presence. Also, if you can't stay out of sight, advance in a zigzag pattern, always getting a bit closer so it never appears you're walking straight towards your subject. And finally, be mindful of your wildlife to try not to get so close as to flush them or disturb their natural behavior. When your subjects start noticing your presence, it's time to stop. 
stay still, and see if they return to their normal behavior. That's what will make the best photos anyway. Flipping food, grooming, preening, playing, those make the best shots. And you won't get these from wildlife that are scared about your presence. Treat your subject with respect and they will reward you with great photos, a win-win. Also, don't forget to go to parks looking for wildlife where there may be more used to seeing people. And wildlife reserves where there may be fenced in but in a natural environment is a great place to practice. Also, in case you're wondering, you don't need camo. It's helpful for mammals with keen eyes, ducks and birds of prey, but for most, wearing the colors of nature is fine. Browns, greens and beiges. Avoid the bright neon colors. By the way, follow me on Instagram and Facebook as I almost always include a photography tip with my posts. And also I have a whole course on wildlife photography targeted at people early to intermediate on their photography journey. Over five hours of content, lessons and behind the scenes. Even photo processing, link in the description below. And finally, we have our equipment, settings and techniques to find our quarry. How do we get pretty pictures? Here's a few quick tips to get you started. One, get to eye level with your subject if you can. If your subject is on the ground, get low with it. Here are two photos taken back to back. Same settings and everything. The low angle really makes the subject pop and makes the photo look like more than documenting what we've seen. The right technique can really help even modest gear shine. Here's a wood duck shot taken with this inexpensive Canon 70 to 300 lens on an entry level Canon M50. The low angle makes all the difference. Try to position yourself so that the background isn't too cluttered. An overly busy background takes the viewer's attention away from your subject. Take photos of wildlife looking in your direction or at worst looking sideways. Looking away doesn't make for pretty photos. And fire in bursts when your subject moves or flips food or shakes off water after a bath. Action makes the best photos. In processing, try not to fill the frame with your subject by cropping. That leads to what I call a bird in a box. Give your subject some room in the frame, especially some room to look or fly into. And I promised you a bonus tip, one based in science. The same physics that give an airplane wing lift also applies to birds. And in the same way that airplanes take off and land into the wind, large birds do the same. When taking off or landing, they point into the wind. And given that we want to take the photos of the fronts of birds, if you stay upwind of a bird in a pond or on the ground, let's say ducks or geese, if they take off or other birds join them, they'll be facing you, taking off in your direction, making for great photos like this. If you like this video, I have a whole playlist on wildlife photography, which you can see right here. If you found this video deserving, give it a like and YouTube will show it to even more people wanting to get into wildlife photography. And I hope that you can use these tips to go out and get your own unique and amazing wildlife photos. I know you can do it.